It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 275 at block height 693,908 on Monday, August 2nd. What's up, guys? Oh, what is it up, man? It's like shit show here, shit show there, arrested people here and there, like uh, a bunch of stuff is going on. But we'll get into all that. Just, uh, what's up with you guys? Can you tell us a story? Many things that cannot be told. I saw a beautiful rainbow today. Oh, I saw a rainbow yesterday. I need to keep my eye out because I'm just seeing a bunch of thunderstorms over here. So guys, can I just comment on something that was eerie as fuck yesterday? Did anybody else just see like almost zero mention of Independence Day? of 2017 of the UASF. Uh-huh. Like no no but it, it was it was eerie as fuck. It was minimal. It was like I it, mean, I saw I feel like an alien in a strange land at this point looking around like who are all these people? I I don't know these people. Do they even have hats? No. No, no, no. No hats. It's aliens. Clubs. Too busy fighting all the declarations of financial dependence. It was minimal. I saw Lop posted something about it, and Samson Mao, and um, just a couple other things. I was going to post something, but I just, I've been really distant with Twitter. I don't like Twitter too much. It's just, yeah. We are well, outnumbered by normies and noobs. For sure that. Strange times. Yeah, I didn't really see much about UASF. I saw a lot about, you know, people really fretting about the potential regulations coming down. And some stuff later we'll talk about. There's been a couple of shit shows. You want to take us into the first one? Well, yeah, just uh, let's get into it. I mean, happy belated Independence Day, Bitcoin. We uh, shook off some forks a long time ago. I hope you recall the story. So let's get into what's going on nowadays, since we're in 2021 and not 2017 anymore. Well, the past few days, everyone's been freaking out on Twitter about rumblings in D.C. Turns out those early warnings were very prudent, and the Senate worked out language to finalize this new infrastructure bill. It's labeled infrastructure, but later I'll show you how it's going far beyond typical infrastructure. However, it is an infrastructure bill, and in it there's definitely spending in that direction. $110 billion for roads and bridges, $73 billion for electrical grid upgrades, $66 billion for Amtrak and rail services, $65 billion for broadband expansion, $55 billion on clean drinking water, $39 billion for transit. And now, how is all this going to be paid for? Everyone was yelling to get your coins off exchanges. Extra money from COVID relief is one way they're going to pay for this, but the other is the IRS estimated they have around $28 billion in unpaid taxes through those seeking to evade taxes in the crypto market, which is kind of crazy because most traders I know overreport their earnings to cover their asses because the IRS has been so vague about how exactly to report. Anyway, this amount really just equates to a guesstimate by the IRS. Anyway, we can expect a lot more heavy-handed regulation towards reported earnings and the regulatory push on exchanges to lock down everyone's information on who's buying and selling and what their buying and selling price is. Now, there is more cause for concern when it comes to this new bill. The way the language is currently written has lots of potential to hurt the mining sector here in the U.S., 
which is around 10 to 15 billion a, a year right now in the in the mining industry in the US. And that's like uh according to Nick Carter on Twitter. But Jerry Brito from Corner says on Twitter, quote, we didn't get the language we wanted in the final bill text. It's better than where it started, but it's still not good enough to clearly exclude miners and similarly situated persons. How here's how it started and the final with the changes we were able to get, close quote. Now the final language that's written into the bill is as follows, quote, any person who, for consideration, is responsible for regularly providing any service of effectuating transfers of digital assets on behalf of another person, close quote. And now everyone is rightfully worried this language is written to include miners and lightning nodes. Even Trezor has put out a tweet saying they don't understand if it includes their service. They say, quote, we are monitoring the situation. We will let our users know about potential consequences once we know more about the details of the actual implementation. It's still a proposal, close quote. <clears throat> Which that's a great point to bring some brevity to this story. This is just one step in a multi-step process before anything is before anything written in this bill becomes law of the land. And Jerry Brito says, quote, starting tomorrow, there will be an amendment process where changes to the bill can be still made. We're working with our friends and allies in the Senate to make this happen, close quote. So this week, there will be a lot of lobbying going on in D.C. by the industry to try and get this language correct. It's a sick system, but for sure there, there is time to get the changes necessary to make sure this bill doesn't hurt our industry in the U.S. That's going to require more lobbying in D.C. over the next week. Good time to donate to Coin Center, I suppose, or uh, your favorite representative sponsoring the bill and let him know what's up. And uh, before I wrap up the story, you should know this is... $1 trillion infrastructure bill, if it passes the Senate this week, it has to go to the House, where representatives are trying to tie it to the bigger $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill, which has a lot to do with social equity and very diverse topics, divisive topics. That uh, Then if it passes there, the president will probably pass it blindly and uh, sign it into law. And D.C., uh, Likes to pass laws so quick no one can actually read them. This one's almost 3,000 pages. I don't know if you guys got a chance to read it or read the sentiments on the interwebs. Uh, what did y'all think? Well, I think that a vague, open-ended, nonsensical bit of text like that um, snuck into a big bill like this that's just totally open to interpretation um, would be exactly what you would want to do um, with the third draft of the or FATF shit coming out soon to uh, kind of, you know, put U.S. law arbitrarily, if you want, totally in sync with the FATF proposals, which will totally have some clause about minors in the next version before it gets finalized. Uh, that, that's what I think. Janine, bud? I think that's definitely an interesting take on things. I mean, it it's going to fit in with the rest of the day's news just from how oh, kind of last minute and sneaky it is. It does seem like uh, like they're trying to do the lockstep with FATF, which, I mean, if that's a travel rule compliant block system. Bitcoin does not abide by those regulations. It's just a ban on the industry. I mean, dude, that's, that's entirely what's happening. Like. You know, let, let, let's get political for a second. Um, you know, the Trans-Pacific Trade Treaty. The first thing Donald Trump did when he took office day one was veto that. The trade treaty ostensibly for American allies to gang up on China and put together a trade block that had things buried in it like... Oh, a clause where private tribunals internationally could be put together to sue a sovereign nation for passing laws to, say, protect their own environment that cost a company money to comply with and get paid out 20 years ahead of time for all the lost profits to comply with that. Shit like that, Barry, it. torpedoed that. That's going to come back. But the, the kind of way that happened was the closed door shit you can't read the text of the bill the little leaked draft versions 
that people pushed out through WikiLeaks at the time. It's, it's we don't even know who fucking wrote this. Like who who inserted this in this bill? I mean, don't you get the same kind of vibe? Yeah, we, I mean, I can. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We do know who wrote it, Shinobi. Anti Satoshi. The lizard people. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. The but lizard no, people like, in shady alleys. It, dude, it's like this this is Yeah. This is completely arbitrarily in sync with the FATF shit whenever you want, which is attempting to KYC all the layers of shit. Like I I've, I've said this for years. If Bitcoin is actually going to work it's going to become the only fucking thing that tax authorities give a shit about this is one of those fucking things getting laid that gives them the rails to go after it we want our cut for the good of the nation yeah i mean that's where i was saying it also seems like just a shakedown of the industry like i mean you got to go grease the right dc sleeves you know the mining industry does but I mean, I guess that's happening a little bit. I mean, just a little update. Jerry Brito tweeted this afternoon. He said, uh, quote, little update. I see a ray of sunshine on the horizon. We are pushing and getting folks who understand to weigh in. No matter what anyone says, we can do better than the current draft language. More soon, exclamation point. And uh, let me pull this up real quick. Senator Toomey, I guess, is the one that's like uh, made a statement that he says, quote, or no, it's uh, Senator Ron Wyden. Ron Wyden supports, he says, supports reporting rules for cryptocurrency exchanges, which is what the provision aims to do, according to an aide. His concern is that the language lacks clarity and could mean that developers of blockchain technologies such as wallets, which allow users to manage different crypto transactions, have to provide information to the IRS, which could pose potential, which could pose technological challenges and cause unintended consequences. Wyden hasn't ruled out putting forward his own amendment as a fix. So there's already like a senator putting forward an amendment to try and change some of this language. Well, that's a hopeful thing. I was going to have to go reconcile with the House version eventually anyway, right? But if you can get it struck out of this one, then at least it's not there as a precedent. Just imagine what other shit they always put into the law this way and nobody even notices because nobody cares because the media doesn't generate enough press coverage. And that and it's just terrible information flow right now of what people should be paying attention to and what's important. So, I mean, yeah, there is like some, I don't know, ray of sunshine, as Jerry Brito says, like, you know, it's something could come out of it to where the language isn't so fuzzy but for sure it's up in the air and you know we'll see how it goes and it is feel like that where there's just like some legislation being written somewhere and we barely get a look at it before it gets passed and i mean they're already talking about that this has bipartisan support and this is going to get passed uh, by the end of this week but yeah i mean it will go to the house it'll be a part of a bigger debate and a bigger bill but, I mean, it does seem to be working in lockstep with some sort of, you know, edge, you know, the global tyranny on people's financial assets. Let's trust the future of the internet to a group of people who have an average age of 65. So, to quote FUD, when do we get our NSA email accounts? <laughs> They're coming. We need our, our Fed coin accounts and we need our NSA accounts. All right. You guys crack jokes for a second. I need another beer for this one. Um, but yeah. Two, two, think, two shakes, two seconds. I think this is ultimately a secretary empowerment issue. I mean, it really speaks to the technical prowess and just general performance of the, the secretariat on that administration level uh that they can translate the real world and the broader internets and who knows maybe even a little slice of reality into you know phrases and thought patterns that somebody like joe biden could interpret and also transpose him for the world real service to humanity these people 
On the other hand, I'm still seeing tweets about people trading cryptocurrencies based on um, horoscopes uh, and planetary movements. So, um, you know, there's shit on both sides. The prophecy was fulfilled. Trading is like stuff of yesteryear. You got to be in NFTs to be with the hype shit nowadays. If you ain't got crypto pumps, what are you even doing here? Right. Oh, right. Have crypto punks and crypto kitties. I have a question. So, if you were applying for something, and one of the questions in the application was, "How do you feel about NFTs?" How would you answer this question? They're stupid, except for Magic the Gathering. I would fill in the warm and fuzzy circle. I would say it lacks understanding of art. Unless it's Magic the Gathering. It's great that somehow the popular media or some entity figured out how to contextualize to people in this iteration that blockchains were essentially for low resolution JPEGs. And, uh, you know, I'll always be fascinated with the hows and the whys of that. But anybody who actually gets it and is a huge NFT fan, I'm, I'm interested by, because really, NFT just means I have a key to something. That's all that means at this point, because you don't actually have a picture. You don't actually have a sound file. You don't actually have rights to anything. You've just got a key probably to somebody's database. And, you know, that's, that's kind of very cryptocurrency native anyway, right? Like, just got a key. So it, when open dime with a hologram projector to show dancing rare pepes. <laughs> My answer would be y'all need to learn about digital signatures to prevent fraud. Duh. Someone should make an NFT. Someone should make an NFT of this infrastructure bill. Fraud. Yes. Fraud was a was a segue word there. It's a, it's a potential segue word. Oh, it is, huh? I think if you were going to make NFTs out of frauds, you'd need to start a collection. I got to do it. So, yeah. Uh, Ricardo uh, Spagni, Fluffy Pony, is in American jail. My little jail. pony. He's, he, he's in American jail right now. Um, yeah. So he got popped flying from New York State to Mexico at a refueling stop in Nashville, Tennessee on July 21st um, due to an extradition request from South Africa. So um, yeah. Pretty much, uh, let me find the company name real quick. Um, Capes Cookies, um, a IT company that he worked for between 2009 and 2011. He is accused of effectively defrauding them of just shy of $100,000 um, like USD value of South African Rand um, during that time period by issuing fraudulent invoices from their suppliers to the company he worked for with payment details for a bank account in his personal name. Um, and apparently a trial for this in um, I think think um johannesburg um in that local jurisdiction although don't quote me on this because it's been like two hours since i read through this um but yeah the, the trial started there um over this issue in april and he fled south africa according to the government um and so, yeah, uh, the statute of limitations in South Africa on a fraud charge like this is 20 years. And I find this 
absolutely insane and mind-boggling, even if these charges are totally true. Um, he faces up to 20 years in prison for this. And and uh, he's being completely denied bail um, due to numerous court precedents over American history dealing with extradition requests where judges have continuously ruled that the entire idea of, of bail um, undermines the entire nature of an extradition request, which is we got you to give you to your government because they asked us to, um, which is kind of hard to do if you let somebody bail out. Um, and specifically, the fact that he was involved with Monero um, is known to have um, cryptocurrency investments. And specifically, in the filing, um, the fact that he has watches worth hundreds of thousands of dollars were all um, reinforcing arguments to deny him bail. Um, so, yeah. Um, I guess in closing, to be a little facetious, uh, like this is court, uh, I kind of find it hard to believe that if he did something like this, he would be so fucking stupid as to have money wired to a bank account in his personal legal name. Um, that just seems utterly retarded. Um, and like, fuck dude, like I said, even if this is true, like the potential of 20 years for a hundred grand embezzled, like that seems insanely out of balance there. Also, why now? And also, I mean, I'm sure like, again, the, the only details we have are the, are there any other documents in the docket? Because I did not check. I only saw the one about the extradition request. Um, I didn't check at all. It just the one that uh, Odell posted. Because it would not surprise me if, you know, if he was traveling, like, according to Anita Posh, he was on his way to the Satoshi mm -hmm. Roundtable. So if he was traveling for a conference... And it just so happened, well, according to, I think it said that the arrest warrant in South Africa was issued in April, so that was obviously mm -hmm. a while ago, but maybe he was traveling during that time and he wasn't even aware of the arrest warrant in South Africa. I have no idea, no idea where he was or where he's been, but it sounds like he was at least in South Africa at that time, or believed to be. Um, I don't know. I it would not surprise me if just due to his travel schedule, maybe he just wasn't aware of these arrest warrants and you know they then accuse him of you know fleeing when actually he was just doing travel for conferences and wasn't aware of these things happening and then gets in trouble for fleeing when he's just moving around mm -hmm. it's just troubling also that you don't hear about it for two weeks like uh nobody's really said anything it's like yep. all of a sudden now we hear about it and like he's, uh, you know, like you're saying, he's denied bail. And this has happened uh, more recently. Like, uh, let me pull this up. Yeah, like I just heard uh, before we started, there was a, a talk and I saw Matt O'Dell was talking. He mentioned like that there was uh, some guys from New Hampshire that this also happened to. And I'm looking it up. Uh, Ian Freeman uh, from Keene uh, in New Hampshire. I guess like uh, they also like have like there was a case where a prominent libertarian organizer and minister from Keene was arrested along with five other New Hampshire residents, faces money laundering charges as it relates to operation of an unlawful virtual currency exchange. And, uh, says like, it's carried like this carries a 10 year minimum sentence, but like, yeah, similarly he's denied bail because he's like considered a flight risk or something. And so, I mean, like, it seems like, uh, I don't, and this is this is just a story is from earlier this year March March nineteenth of twenty twenty one, so I mean like uh, maybe there's you know this is all kind of just like something where more uh, enforcement is actually getting pushed down, and there's like an unfortunate protocol of like don't let these guys go once we got them. 
Uh, how do you scare people into doing stuff if you don't make examples? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of fucked up. And it, it, it's just... Yeah. Let's just say the more I see, like, shit happening to people in this space who have not been engaged in like outright scams or frauds in this space like mm, there's something to that like every time that happens another time like there's a pattern to think about there yeah it's pretty serious but just to bring a little joke in calvin Iyer says it's because everybody's against craig wright Hey, dude, I brought up multiple times, what if Craig is just some fucking spook trying to push things in some compliant, centralized direction? Hmm? That's what mainly seemed like most of those forks were. Yep. But anyway, uh, this last thing I'll have to say on this is, like, ask fucking questions if people just vanish or go dark without some explanation like you know what i mean check on your neighbors or your peers mm -hmm. all right well that's some crazy news but i guess this is all kind of moving in lockstep with some greater regulatory plan uh janine were you the one going to tell us about what's going on with binance yeah, just kind of a small funny story uh, last couple of days where Binance, uh, well, you know, we've all heard the phrase, you can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. It's commonly given as advice to new people who may be put off by the uh, high price of Bitcoin uh, to teach them that on-chain Bitcoin is divisible by 100 million Satoshis. Um in the world of custodial exchanges, a variation of this expression may become relevant um, if you are not fully compliant with increasingly detailed know your customer policies, which is you can only withdraw a fraction of a Bitcoin. Uh, because Binance announced that they adjusted their daily withdrawal limit to 0 0.06 BTC, so 6% of a Bitcoin, for accounts which have completed only basic account verification. Uh, this is their lowest tier requiring personal information like name, birthday, and address, but actually no uh, identity documents. Um, CEO uh, Shang Peng Zhao tweeted that this was one of the, quote, active steps we're taking to build upon our efforts to be more compliant with local regulations everywhere. Um, so yeah, you went from being able to take out two of your own Bitcoin in your own account to being able to take out 6% of a Bitcoin per day. So it would take you quite a long time to take out all of your Bitcoin if you have two or more Bitcoin in there and can only take out 6% of it per day. Yikes. Rack. See the exchanges all getting squeezed, all the Wild West places that didn't KYC that let you deal with a uh, decent volume, et cetera, et cetera. Welcome to the era of the Bitpenny. Remember Bitmax? Funds are safe. Ooh. What I find, so I was looking at what their policies are because they have basic, intermediate, and advanced. And I found it kind of funny that the only difference between their intermediate and advanced uh, account verification is that the advanced verification has you submit a proof of address. That's it. Mm. You gotta be advanced. Fancy. To have real real estate. That creates a database, though, that ties it to your legal identity, which means tax authorities can go after it. Hey, guys, you ever wonder, like, when a nation state's gonna, like, legalize hacking um, foreign exchanges to try to, you know, get data on whether or not your citizens are trading there? I mean, like, we were already in the weird place where, like, a corporation can hack back if they get hacked. <clears throat> and it's okay. It's a weird world. Just build it into the internet and blame the internet. Touche. Well, I guess... Yeah.
the the underhanded hacks are coming back at us. Uh, One of our long-term allies, something big going on in this direction. What's up with uh, Japan? Yeah, so this is uh, one of those fun geopolitical indicators. Uh, One of the largest uh, funds holding Social Security type funds, or I should say pension funds in the world, is this uh, Japanese general pension fund, the GPIF. And these guys have come right along and evidently they've slashed their U.S. government bonds and bills. Uh, holding percentage by about 12% of total U.S. foreign debt. So down from 47% or about half to 35, about a third. Uh, This is important because this fund is a $1.7 trillion fund uh, that holds general pension funds for most of Japan, I believe. And uh, I, I just thought there were some interesting things in the article that might be worth sharing as well uh this pension fund makes an average 7.1 percent return on its overseas debt uh which is kind of spectacular considering how much of that is u.s debt and that our debt doesn't yield that much uh but evidently that's the case and uh another one of the notes in there was that even though they slashed it in percentage terms the fund has grown so much that they actually added 1.1 1.1 trillion won uh, of absolute treasury holdings, which I believe is around a billion dollars. Um, so not that much, but even though they're slashing, they're actually adding. Uh, where did that allocation go to? Mostly Euro area countries, uh, France, Germany, Italy. Hmm. That's interesting because I saw a thing uh that today uh monday um i guess a bunch of investment funds in germany are going to be allowed to invest up to 20 percent in bitcoin or hold 20 percent in bitcoin um a lot of them are not going to do that right away it's going to probably take a couple of years but um that's a big deal because uh some of those funds that will be eligible are pension funds yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of that type of fund. I believe it starts with an S. We covered this uh, a couple months ago. Things are going to fucking domino. It's really funny because like if you've ever gone to like one of these kind of businesses that like helps helps you set up a pension, they'll be all like flashy about how much you can, you know, expect to get covered and such and it's like pales in comparison to bitcoin (laughs) right love those returns just buy bitcoin stack sets yep the uh i don't know the uh the feeling you get from actually getting to control that wealth also there that's invaluable you can't compare that to anything else that's true it's like, hmm, thank you for reassuring me that I will continue to be able to eat cat food in my old age. I'll go with something else, thanks. <laughs> Dude, That'll Japan be needs Bitcoin. Like, they are, like, one of the first first world countries I could see actually just diving into Bitcoin. Like, their entire economy has been stagnating for 30, 40 years Like, they are a a fucked, like, service economy, like us. Like, the production of things is really kind of narrowed and concentrated, like, just like us. And, like, there's so many fucking social and economic problems just compounding so far ahead of the curve versus us. Like, if any like developed nation is going to jump into the bitcoin bandwagon all in it's going to be them like they're going to be the first i had some hope for them when i heard that you could buy bitcoin on your what on your train pass card over there i mean that sounded they've done pilots and like integrations to shit from my understanding like to the point it's kind of like switzerland it's like i'm i'm not even up to date with like all the little shit going on over there 
Yeah, it just sounded really easy. But yeah, That'd be great. This this same pension fund is the pension fund that owns a huge percent of outstanding Japanese debt. I think they own something like in the fifty to the seventy percentile of outstanding Japanese government debt is just owned by this pension fund. Yep. It's good stuff. Five percent allocation to Bitcoin, guys. Just think about it. <laughs> I mean, you laugh, dude, but just them making that big of a drawdown in terms of U.S. bond holdings, like, didn't they draw down, like, 12% of their, like, net holdings that were in fucking U.S. bonds, but... Yep, so they could go chase yield and negative yielding European bonds. Yeah, so, like, what are they thinking? <laughs> Doesn't sound that safe in the day. I don't know. I was impressed when we covered the uh, bonds getting issued by Japanese companies, the blockchain based bonds, and uh, that mining pool had something like over 1% of global hash rate, which isn't a lot, but isn't a little. That's true. Yeah, it sounds know. like good stuff for Japan. Yep, yep. Potentially. I mean, because it's like seriously, like. I mean, like, yeah, dude, like France, wealth taxes, I'm, like, did they go negative? But, like, Germany definitely went negative for large things. Italy is kind of a shit show. France, it's, it's like, um, I get America's fucking around right now, but it's like, France is ready to tear itself apart from what I see over like COVID passport shit. Like that's where you want to invest your money. What's the fucking strategy there? Yeah, that's a good point. And I would say also Japan's economy is very much based on having massive amounts of capital and, you know, a lot of their, uh, Bigger industries have been these conglomerates that are good at doing R&D, good at doing heavy industry type stuff, um, good at keeping IP and doing manufacturing. Uh, so large scale and capital intensive type activities. If it's capital intensive, just get some of that Bitcoin into the country. You know, they're already good at capital intensive, either in the production sense or in the managing capital long term sense. No, but it's like that's what I mean is like they are like economically a mirror version of us just further along the curve. I mean, like, you know, look, look at some of the things that they specialize in that is like, you know, same thing as us, same as a lot of um, like service based economies in terms of what real industries do they have fucking construction and engineering like Bechtel, Halliburton. Like, there's a reason that these com or companies fucking are all over the damn world building shit. It's because that, that's a fucking thing that costs a lot of money and takes a lot of fucking skill. Like, those are the types of industries that Japan actually has industrial capacity in, just like us. But for the most part, everything else is just drifted into services. Yep. You know, they had a thriving manufacturing industry at one time, and I believe they got priced out in a lot of ways uh, to China, just like we did. Yep. Well, I mean, we all kind of know the history, right? I mean, Japan's economy was t entirely retaken over and reshaped by the U.S. after World War II, so it makes sense that it kind of mirrors and looks like. Yeah, but it's the point that they've accelerated and they're past us on the development curve. So they're like a canary in the coal mine, kind of. Well, one day we'll see one of these major countries take a step towards Bitcoin, you know. So it might be Japan. Speaking guess, of major steps towards Bitcoin. Yeah, it seems like uh, Saudi Arabia was ready to maybe make a big major step towards Bitcoin, but uh, it looks like. That news here has uh, failed to start, so to speak. So um, there were some rumors running around that Saudi Arabian gas company Saudi Armco, Armco, Armco was going to start mining Bitcoin with its excess energy, most likely through flare mining, which would be huge considering it's one of the largest companies in the world by revenue. 
However, it's not meant to be. Yahoo Finance reports Saudi Aramco denies Bitcoin mining initiative. They say the world's third largest company by market cap, Saudi Aramco, has reportedly denied any reports that it was going to start Bitcoin mining operations using gas flare energy. Quote, with reference to recent reports claiming that the company will embark on Bitcoin mining activities, Aramco confirms that these claims are completely false and inaccurate. Close quote. So there you have it. I mean, uh, nothing to see here, so to speak. What do you guys think? Um, well, if it's true, then I just have to say I thought that Saudi Arabia was acknowledging reality because if, if I remember right, Aramco is uh, completely state owned. Um, and we're planning how to deal with, like, you know, the fact that their entire economy is government funded public sector shit that the private sector can't compete with because of all the oil money but the oil money inevitably can't last forever just given the economics of that so they need to and are actually over the last 10 years or more um, been trying to shift towards incentivizing more private sector development and a lack of reliance on the oil money I thought like, wow, they finally went like, oh, Bitcoin, stack Bitcoin with this while we still have it, then we can figure shit out. But if not, then you fucked up Saudi Arabia because <laughs> like if they don't figure out how to sustainably work without such dependence on oil money um, in the long run, that entire country um, and society is just fucked. <laughs> I would just wonder if if rumors got ahead of facts in terms of uh, how executed on they are in their plan or that sort of thing, then probably their best play right now would be not to acknowledge that they were actually thinking about it. Because you could just imagine how much mining equipment somebody like Saudi Aramco could bring online. And if you don't already have contracts, sources, or a flow on that stuff, you might just be better off not acknowledging it because you're just telling competitors it should cost more. Absolutely. That's kind of what I read. It's like, okay, you know, there's like some rumors because of the fact that there probably are some, you know, people on these uh, third counter, these uh, third party markets, just like, you know, the, af the market for miners, you know, and like, you know, that sort of amount of equipment moving around, I would imagine something would come out like a rumor and, you know, to dispel that before things are put in place and hash rates online would make a lot of sense. I would just say it would make sense that there was a global chip shortage if somebody like Aramco actually say bought out Chinese fab time. Just saying. But there's so many fucking fabs in China. I don't even know why we're short chips. But for sure, the I know Saudi Arabia is also trying to do something outside of oil and gas because oil and gas is so their economy. And they have like an entire area of the country that they're trying to build, you know, like high speed rail and entire digital infrastructure and try to create like the world of tomorrow. I can't remember the name of it now, but you know, it's part of the whole bigger plan on recreating cities in this new image of basically a surveillance state. Yeah, you guys might remember the photograph of Trump and the various uh, emirs and Saudi princes and whoever all putting their hand on the glowing ball. Right, right. <laughs> dude, I'm just saying it's basic oil well economics, dude. <clears throat> like, you know, there, there's a reason peak oil as a theory exists, despite how it continues to be laughably proven wrong in terms of the big global picture, because you can find more oil until you can't. It's still a, a fucking fact in terms of well dynamics. And when you're a country that only has so much jurisdiction under your control, eventually the well dynamics fucking taper out on average. And then if you depend entirely on that oil for your economy, you're fucked. Like that's just reality. Yeah. And not to mention, maybe you'll be in a spot where you've got a whole populace that has been 
basically completely subsidized off oil welfare money that just isn't used to having to do fucking shit besides go to McDonald's. It's horrible. Anyway, yep, they've been trying. I wish them the best of luck. Get some of that high tech shit in there. Go study the Israelis. Like, do some spying on the Israelis and figure out how they do all the hydro shit in the desert, Saudi. Come on. Yep. Oh, dude, they are totally in the spying game. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they are probably in the mining building game as well right now. I would just, like, if I was taking bets or something, I'd. Odds are there's probably going to be some Saudi Aramco uh, mining facility in the near future being discussed. Dude, it would be straight up negligent, basically, for them not to have some sort of seed project trying mining. You, I mean, I would think at this point in 2021, it's just them, Iran, Russia, they're just all too well positioned with hydrocarbons not to be considering something like this. Or even again, all those aforementioned emirs, they don't have a whole lot of square footage on their countries, but they've got all the energy you could ever want. I mean, like, it's like, fuck, even just using <clears throat> the waste byproducts, which can be converted into energy, great American mining upstream, et cetera, style. That is a huge, like, why the fuck aren't you doing that? Yeah, that's a slow play. And you can just, I mean, how many years worth of chip supply would they need to just do that much? It would be a lot. The market is hot. Dude, like, if China doesn't fuck Taiwan, like, the entire world will, will just start rolling out the money carpet going, hey, TSMC, come build fab here. Oof. It's a big yeah. what if, though. It's one of those narratives that I almost missed from the beginning of COVID, the idea that we're actually going to build stuff in America again. I just don't hear the kids talking about it anymore. We do build things. We build despair. Oh. But that's only for export. You gotta get to Texas, man, where they're getting into mining. We build despair, and also we incentivize vaccination with junk food no 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 nowadays it's like tyrannical governors just forcing it in order to get into a business it's like really crazy i mean pretty much new york i don't know if you're in new york and you're a bitcoiner get out of there um snake plissken tried to warn you if you don't heed the warning um i don't know what to tell you and stop, Darn. you better get out of there, too. All right, though. We are we are meandering. I'm doing a horrible job stopping the meandering because I've, right. I've had a few beers. Well, understandable. So what is going on with uh, Bitmain? Yeah, so this is kind of interesting. Um, apparently... Antpool is being spun off from Jihan Wu's fork of Bitmain um, with most of the legal prep apparently finished by May 1st. Um, just the last, um, you know, things being finalized right now and uh, being handed off to McCree Zan's fork of uh, Ant or, uh, Bitmain. And, uh, yeah, it's just really like, I'm not, it, it, it's kind of, I don't know, I think FUD can kind of fill in the gaps with where I'm going here, but I think there is probably a pretty decent strategy, uh, as far as what Jihan is doing. I think he is strategically cutting different parts of the business to recapitalize and try and move in another direction. And I just find it interesting. Like one of the things that he maintained control of in the split of the company was the actual mining farms um, in North America and shit outside of Chinese jurisdiction um, when the, the Bitmain fork actually happened. And he's giving up now the pool coordinator 
you know, ant pool that Bitmains run since the beginning almost that generates just passive revenue off of the, the mining hardware from a- anyone mining with them. Um, I think he's kind of just completely pivoting and it's interesting that he's holding on to the farms and hardware instead of this, um, given what one of his other um, relatively recent ventures post him and McCree having a fallout is going. If you want to kind of just roll roll with that here, Fud. Yeah, it, it could just be when the wheels are coming off the bus, you want to consolidate uh, your power and or revenue streams uh, in places that you can keep them, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying like how that might relate to the uh, the Matrix port um, news and, and, and that whole side of things. Oh, yeah. Well, that is an interesting synergy. So uh, another story we've got up here is the Matrix port, which is a crypto bank. I'm trying to remember how they just build themselves, but I think I read the phrase crypto bank in there. Uh, it's essentially quite similar to BlockFi, might have twice as many assets under AUM or right around there. Uh, I don't know exactly how big BlockFi is these days, but I think these matrix port guys have 10 billion AUM, uh, not open US customers. So I had not heard of them previously, but offer most of the types of financial services that somebody like BlockFi offers. Um, And I wonder if this wouldn't be suitable like you're hinting at for integration with the financial side in that if you've got a financial services company that pays out interest in bitcoin what do you need you need a stream of bitcoin right um which we actually got to see blockfi um get together with blockstream to announce uh, a mining uh install for them um and that just seems to fit so maybe some of this reorg does well align with uh working with some of the external stuff i'm sure he has his his finger in a number of pies you know uh but the matrix port stuff raising a hundred million dollars that's that's no small deal um they must be doing work outside the country in 10 billion aum no small deal either Mm -hmm. like you know do i think the trends are just like the more you look around more and more vertical integration and especially with like yield chasing businesses like that and like it man lightning needs some serious upgrades like we need ptlc's instead of like htlc's we need adapter signatures instead of fucking hash locks we need to start thinking through like the HTLC problem and and just fucking spamming shit up more because like dude this is exactly like dude right now lightning is a fucking children's toy it is something where all the nodes all the liquidity are people who socially know each other friends like the the connections across social groups like that like it's an old boys network it is not adversarial in the fucking slightest hello hello what block is fucking investing in miners what matrix ports synergizing with miners hello they're not going to do that with lightning nodes why would they hello like it's going to fucking happen and that is what is going to kick things into adversarial fucking high gear. Like, it's not going to be the little toy it is right now where nothing goes fucking wrong. Because any way that you can fuck them so that you attract more traffic to get a higher fucking yield, guess what you're going to do? Because you're an economically rational actor. Hello? Yeah, and I can't wait for that next round of tooling uh, because these centralized organizations that are jumping into this, they can build out internal tooling that can do all sorts of things because it has hooks all sorts of places and, uh, you know, works very well for the services they want to provide. We have to keep kicking out improvements to our building blocks to keep up. Yep. 
like lightning needs to generalize more otherwise the other thing about ptlcs is we ultimately get rid of watchtowers right uh nope just the privacy dynamic of um like nodes not being able to connect uh a payment like if, if you assume that you have the payment breaking up among multiple paths and because of adapter signatures you don't have the pre-image that's going to be the same for every hop um like then even if you have like five nodes along a payment you're not going to be able to put that together that that's what's going on you know what i mean nice but it's like you know there there's like because at the end of the day dude if we structure if things are evolve and structure themselves properly like to the end user these things won't matter except for like the battle of fees you know what i mean like shit should be able to be plugged together right generalized enough in the right places that the money still flows but the the whole dynamic of like where this is going is if all these entities flood into and try to get all the fucking yield then you're talking about a potential environment where a single entity is running a large portion of the lightning nodes and providing the liquidity which is exactly the kind of scenarios where like the theoretical um privacy attacks on lightning that could be done are now viable because there's actually an economic incentive for somebody to like make up that much of the network you know what i mean so that product like we need to start implementing the fucking things that mitigate those types of large-scale attack vectors because there is quite literally a fucking economic incentive for somebody to be in that position and it's it's like yeah like <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry but like holy shit how are these not things being talked about constantly we live in a chaotic world man and this is a specialized subject matter but for sure like, uh, I do see uh, more lightning uh, work as far as trying to make things more, you know, like you're saying, just more generalized to where people can get in and spin up nodes and build out a system that works and is functional. It's just a lot of stuff going on in this world. Crazy stuff. Yeah, we're Bitcoiners, so let's pay attention to Bitcoin. That's true. I mean, at this point, we do need to kind of ring the bell and just like tell people like, you know, whatever you're, you know, like think is going on in this crazy world. Like, you know, this is the more important thing that you should be focusing your energy on. Like, so what is also getting developed? Damn it. I need, an, I need another beer. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. I'm just going for it. That's all right. It's a Monday, folks. I have a Beatles line stuck in my head now. What? <laughs> Don't know why you say goodbye. I say hello. Beatles were great. Hello, hello. You know, we kept repeating hello, hello over and over again. Hello. Monday, Monday. McFly. La, la. All right. So what is the next big development oh me shifting to the highest apv beer in the variety pack <laughs> status update i have recently tested more beers and they are all equally shit wait what the fuck do you like IPAs okay we need, or we need to take which, a like, pause we need to yeah we need to talk about this for a right second now what <laughs> you like more pilsners or ipas or like the dark beers what's your favorite i'm sorry you are a teetotaler um, what 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 is going on? I don't know. Don't you live in a, a region where the beer's supposed to be satisfactory? I think we do the need best to dig in into the world, this dude. deeper. Like, dude, yeah. I, when I was in Berlin, I literally every bar I was at went, "Give me a random beer." I did not get a single bad beer. What are you talking about? You might need to. I don't even know what they're called. You might need to go see a tongue specialist for your taste buds. No, I think that's the problem. My taste, my taste buds are. <laughs> you mean... Wow, my tongue, my tongue just went dysfunctional. Okay, um, 
No, the the difference is that my tongue is healthy, and most people who have drunk alcohol a lot have unhealthy tongues that have been killed by whatever is in this nasty drinks that you all love. Fascinating theory. I am not drunk. Yeah, right. Hmm. Can't feel your tongue anymore. Hmm. I'm just joking. No, it's good to hear that you've tasted around and sampled and selectively decided it's not for you. I mean, like, you know, it's not for everyone, but there are some beers out there that are really tasty, so don't rule them out loud. Say that. White Russian. All beers are tasty except lagers produced in America and Pilsners because they White. just suck. White Russians have so much cream that you almost can't taste the alcohol. Yeah. That's a I'm different just, game. I might have a little moment of silence for your tongue buds over here. Same. My tongue buds? Yeah. No, mine survived. Mine are good. Don't worry. I am, buds. I am there uncorrupted. Will a, there will be an edited moment of silence that is actually a moment of silence when this hits, hits the stream. No. No, Pilsners are <laughs> nasty. They're like the most popular beer in Germany, and it's disgusting. No, but that's in Germany outside of America, so it's, it's, it's okay. They, they know how to do it right. No, they all taste bad. Sorry. Alrighty. Speaking of liquids. There you go. So. The Dynamic Federation upgrade to Liquid is ongoing as we speak. Um, and Blockstream is regularly posting status reports. Um, so for any of you crazy people out there like me, I'm betting I'll reach every single one of you in the dozen that runs a Liquid full node. This is a hard fork. So you have to upgrade here, but they are, and dude, again, like I'm seriously, when, when we're done with this episode or when I'm done talking, I'm going to yell at Blockstream on Twitter right now about this. Um, like whoever writes these blog posts needs to provide more details. Um, Shinobi, they, if you want the notes <laughs> to do something, you just have to walk hold downstairs. On. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Now, the HSMs are being swapped out in the actual Federation right now to upgrade to this. Um, the first major thing is going to be expand the number of functionaries, which is limited to 15 people right now due to script size, multi-sig limits um, in Bitcoin. Gonna which, need a bigger again, basement. Are you fucking implementing Schnorr and Musig in this? Okay, like that would be a thing to put in the blog post because it's like if you're not, then how are you bypassing those limits? But you don't say schnorr or anything anywhere in the fucking blog post. So it's implied. Just, just fucking state it explicitly. Why are you yelling like, at yourself, Shinobi? Oh, because I this is going to hit a few people's ears because I'm going to shove it in their face. Um, also, the ability to. And I think this is a huge fucking deal um, to change or disable the emergency keys um, for coin recovery. So <clears throat> the two important things there, not only can you completely remove the emergency recovery key with the time lock in the script, you can change it from block stream. So this update actually does a lot to give the Federation actually operating the chain more ability to move away from and not depend on block stream. And then also um, dynamically change <clears throat> the um, time lock limit for the recovery path if it's active. And then obviously, of course, um, the ability for the Federation to vote on adding or removing Federation members. So last thing if you use liquid that's actually something you should think about and consider because that does change the game theory a little bit on um 
how that federation works. Interesting. So upgrade your lightning nodes appropriately. <laughs> lightning nodes? What? Your liquid nodes. I'm sorry. Did I say lightning? You did. <laughs> yes, you did. Oops. Up, up, upgrade your nodes, Shinobi. Yeah, upgrade your nodes. Nope. You just... I'm staying. All I'm right. staying on this fork. I'm finishing All this right. fork. Shinobi's got his own fork now. Finishing this fork. Monkey fork. All right. Well, you guys want to go into some more shit show craziness that happened this week? Is that a spork? Shinobi. Shinobi fork. Shinobi spork. Hey, my full retard node is still running, man. I'm waiting for you <laughs> miners. Join me. Is it called spork? No, it's Bitcoin Shinobi's vision. BSV. Oh my god. All right. So, I'll uh, just keep going here. Just about 24 hours ago, people started taking to Twitter again to sound the alarm that an exchange, HODL HODL, has, could have become compromised. First, HODL HODL, HODL I'll say HODL HODL, HODL 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 tweeted, quote, Dear all, we are upgrading our security measures and please check your messages for further instructions. Sorry for bad communication. Doing our best. Close quote. Then people started tweeting. They were receiving, quote, sketchy emails asking users to give them a really strong password or be forced into liquidation after two hours, which this does sound pretty sketchy. And Hodel Hodel confirmed it was their emails and they weren't compromised. Later in the replies on the topic, they admit it isn't a platform wide vulnerability, just a problem where certain accounts were targeted, most likely due to weak passwords. Either way, it's definitely a security issue. Users are rightfully upset about their funds being thrown into question. It became such a shit show that Stephen Levera had to take to Twitter to confirm Hodel Hodel's communication has not been compromised. He said, quote, confirmed, I've spoken with Max, their comm channel are not compromised, close quote. Now, after a few hours of all this craziness, Hodel Hodel tweeted out again, Quote, we are initiating forced liquidations in the in those contracts that are still in progress stage, but are considered as quote high risk. This is done to assure safety of your funds. In order to complete the liquidation process, we will need you to undersign the liquidation as well. You can always recre recreate the contract on the same terms after the liquidation with no fees. Please check your contract chat. For more details, close quote. Which now most Bitcoiners are upset about their attempt at communication and transpar transparency during a vulnerability that put people's funds at risk. Indeet on Twitter has some good questions for Hodo Hodo about this route forward. Quote, who will refund the interest plus origin costs paid? Who will pay taxes because of for forced liquidations? Were passwords compromised? Were they stored, hashed, and salted at all? Even if weak passwords, what about the mandatory 2FA? To move funds, two users' passwords needed to be compromised. If one password compromised, there's still 2FA and other two parties. What is the real reason? And uh, yeah, these are all good questions. And it's still early on as this story develops. It's been just over 24 hours. But it's painfully obvious this will hurt Hodo Hodo. It will hurt those who were forced into liquidation. I imagine even those not forced into it are questioning when something like this might happen to them. So this looks pretty bad. So what did you guys think of the situation? Um, did you get a chance to look at this medium that Rico just posted in here? Or did that not make it on the desk in time? No, it did not. Breaking okay, news. is this just well, the, is this just a verification um of like authenticity? It's not like a uh okay, it's not an explanation then. Never mind. Um yeah. Like honestly, dude, I felt really awkward yesterday cuz it was like the minute I saw Stefan vouch for that, it was like um unless his account got hacked too, <clears throat> then this is totally fine. Um, or I mean, totally legit. So it's like, what's 
the fucking underlying issue here because it's like yeah um from my understanding of their architecture like the repayment process has like the the, uh password set up so that you get the address to to send the, the money back um and that's something that's going to have a process that can be attacked so i can understand how like information that they host could be potentially compromised especially depending on password strength and shit or how they stored passwords but it's still it's like that that was so shady how that was done um and it's like I yeah, like I want to see the deeper postmortem here because I could totally see this being they did the best thing they could think to do in the moment and shit, but that just looked so shady yesterday. Yeah, let me just read this from their blog post on the statement. They said, um, you know, secondly, this is like from the middle of the statement. We have started migration liquidation of users' contracts to prevent. The potential loss of funds. Unfortunately, our recent internal and external audit identified that some user payment passwords might have been compromised. This affected a limited number of contracts, but we are taking proactive measures to ensure that everyone is safe. We are still investigating these issues and building tools to easily migrate funds from old escrows to the new ones. We are going to publish a transparency report on the investigation of these issues and fixing them. So, I mean, like, it does seem like they're taking strong stance to try and, um, you know, put out a better communication of what exactly happened because, you know, this was just put out uh, six hours ago from recording. And, I mean, like, I did the research on the story through Twitter, and I didn't even see it posted on Twitter. They just need, like, a better (laughs) communications uh, to get all this stuff out and try and just take the helm of some of this technical hurdles that they're facing and try and just uh, not let it spin out of control like yesterday. I mean, it's like... <clears throat> shit's hard, but like, fuck, man. Like, eh, like th- this kind of shit should be leading to collaboration in how to handle more decentralized applications in this space in a more secure way. Because... The more you try to decentralize shit, the more you're pushing shit onto the user and creating risks, like in terms of interacting with the service provider and what they still do. Yeah, that's kind of the way I've read the whole story from Twitter yesterday. It was like, it seems like people are having trouble with this process. Like, it's just clunky. I think it's just more the lack of explanation or like ability to understand like why this could be like a thing you you know what i mean yep well either way i'm sure uh you know i mean it looks like they're taking the steps to try and uh fix this situation that's good to see i mean you know these exchanges everybody just kind of you know for a long time it's kind of like oh this is a honeypot when's something going to happen and people are just waiting for somebody to exit scam and you know i didn't know looking into it how this was going to play out so it's good to see that they're you know working to resolve this and hopefully they'll just like go up front on like trying to get uh proper communication and just trying to make sure that they're the people using their service understand what they're getting into and that they should probably create strong passwords yep all right, so what is going on with the Breeze? Well, uh, Breeze Wallet got a, uh, yeah. So Breeze Wallet was invested in by CT, um, the subsidy of Acker Investments from Norwegian. Um... Yeah, Breeze is one of those wallets that kind of has a very <clears throat> nuanced trust model involved with how they provide liquidity to their users. And like their fee models for things like interactions on and off chain. And the fact that somebody like Acker 
is investing in, in Breeze. All the comments I made about um, liquidity dynamics as far as Lightning goes, like Bitcoin infrastructure goes, when we were talking about Matrix Port and Jihan, um, that's just reaffirming like everything I said there and my certainty in it. When I look at some fund like that, investing in something like Breeze Wallet, which is just a, it's a Lightning app to use Lightning that put themselves in the middle as a liquidity provider um, to, to make that work. So it's like Lightning needs to really catch the fuck up to these incentive realities or there's going to be a lot of negation in privacy or privacy in terms of the innate properties of that if this kind of shit dominoes like i think it will well we'll just have to hope that it doesn't <laughs> i don't know like lightning is uh you know it's a project i mean it needs to keep moving forward i mean it will man these things are inevitable like people like financial things that generate yield and the people who run those services, those products, will need to find a way to sustainably generate yield. When you're talking about Bitcoin, that's shit like mining, like running a lightning node, like doing anything that generates like revenue in Bitcoin. That's what that is. All right. Like, fuck, come on. I know you, you understand what I'm saying. I heard you can make 30k running a light node. I made 30k yesterday <laughs> running a light node. I'm sorry, dude. Um, I get that Alex is just like kind of trying to put his thoughts out there as somebody running a lightning node and his experiences there, like just on his own time. But, like, dude, that was the most naive, disconnected fucking st from reality statement I've ever seen about the Lightning Network. Like, you're not opening up a global market showing that you can take the amount of capital that only somebody who has a lot of money or got into Bitcoin very early in the developed world has access to, and you can generate 30 grand a year. Like, that's not a fucking global market. Did he ever talk about how much capital he has locked up to generate that? Um, it's somewhere around, and again, there's no real way to look at his side in terms of like liquidity allocation, but more than a million dollars. Yeah, I believe that. That's some yield. That is some yield, though. Even at a million bucks, that's good yield. Yeah, but the point is, you're not opening up some fucking prosperous market to the whole fucking world. It's like, that's not how that works. Yeah, um, that's definitely an approach zero-sum game. I guess something more positive in, in the lightning world. Yeah, there is some positive stuff going on out there. You just gotta keep your eye out for it. There's a uh, pretty cool program available in the show notes. I mean, you'll see a tweet from at PDC Languages. They say, quote, still have a few spots open for beta users. We want some gringos looking to pay a few bucks per week in sats over the Lightning Network to take Spanish lessons from native speakers from Colombia or El Salvador. DM for deets. Uh, and, you know, then they link their to their new program. Uh, hold up, just lost notes. And... Through the Speakable app called Lightning, it's through the Speakable app, and this uh, new program they got launched is called Lightning Languages. It's an attempt to connect Spanish speakers with Spanish learners. It also uses the Lightning Network for all payments, so it will remove the, all the middlemen and fees from trying to learn a language. In the future, you'll probably be paying for this service, but for a limited time, they'll pay you to help them with learners in this new system. So if you're trying to learn Spanish, Give it a shot, and maybe you'll make some Bitcoin connections in the Central American region. So, pretty cool looking program. Um, if I had more time, I'd definitely be signing up for it. But uh, you know, it's hard to come by time these days. 
What do you guys think? Uh, you know, some lightning Spanish? You going to sign up? I mean, dude, I'm not kidding. I was honestly just thinking about it for the fuck of it um, because I should have learned Spanish in high school in the first place. But I'm, in terms of market dynamics here, dude, this is amazing because, like, what's going on in Central America if that continues dominoing? Like, the reality is that a bunch of people from the Western world are going to flood down there and try to figure out ways to make money off of that. And it's just like, I'm, I'm sitting here like, how many people who want to do that know Spanish? Probably the majority of them. So here's a way it's like, before they can go down there and do that, oh, here are people actually from that region who are trying to accumulate Bitcoin to teach people Spanish to go potentially do things like that more effectively. And you have to give them money to acquire that skill. Like, I, I, I think that's fucking awesome. Yeah, it's a weird interplay to try and solve the chicken and egg problem of developers and Bitcoin and your geographic region and just trying to, you know, build that connection where there's people who are, you know, that, you know, that are already down there. And, you know, it just kind of plays into developing out those spaces and those uh, those realities. Like, you know, you meet people and it's like, hey, you know, you start learning Spanish and the next thing you know, you're talking to somebody, you know somebody in Colombia or you know somebody in El Salvador. And so when you go over there, you know somebody and you both found each other through the Lightning Network. So you both have this underlying understanding of Bitcoin. So sounds pretty cool to me. I think anybody that's got some extra time should use it. And especially if you're already into Bitcoin and you don't know Spanish. Yeah, it sounds like it's right up the Sphinx chat kind of application alley where uh, you interconnect to audio and video sharing. Um, you've got your your streams. You've got some persistent form-y type stuff. Uh, sounds tailor-made. Something we definitely need in this moment in time. I wonder if they'll teach Bitcoin-related phrases. Bitcoin-related what? Bitcoin-related phrases. Yeah, they should. That would be fun just to come up with. Like, what's what's your Bitcoin vocab words? No, it's like, you, you guys know what I mean, though. It's like, there is obviously going to be some kind of situation where people not from the area go down there to try to make money. It's, it's, a, it's a little poetic if this whole thing gets mean to the point where it's like, before you can do that for most people who would want to, you got to you gotta send some money down there and figure out how to talk to people. Because... Yeah, hot. You know what I mean? Get the scammers before they scam. I'm just saying it's one of those interesting, hilarious situations where natural market dynamics potentially accomplish something you could call social justice without having to force it and truth no. about it and like act like a lunatic. I'm just saying. Uh, Alright, alright. I see what you're saying. Alright, alright. So what's going on in the world of join market it's been a while how's things going over there fidelity bonds what fidelity bonds um so with join market prior to this it has been pretty cheap and easy to have a civil attack in terms of market makers providing mixing liquidity like there's nothing stopping people from just running separate instances of join markets, hoping that a taker, somebody just trying to pay to mix, would um, kind of just statistically mix with only this malicious party's makers. And so that party knew where all their coins were. Because the whole idea with join market is if you keep remixing and selecting different parties to mix with, you wind up blurring everything together so that no one party can actually figure out where your shit is. Um, one of the long proposed solutions for this is a fidelity bond. So a maker locking up Bitcoin so that um, it, it was time locked and they could just publicly post this whenever they're offering their, their liquidity to mix with and go look at how much Bitcoin 
I have locked up for how long in order to prove that I'm not Sybil attacking things and I'm just trying to make money. Um, this last release of Join Market has finally implemented this. And the whole idea here is now instead of randomly selecting, um, you know, makers to uh, mix with, <clears throat> when a new um, upgraded taker client judges like who to mix with, they will prefer people um, statistically who have like advertised a fidelity bond. And they will prefer people who have put up a larger fidelity bond um, with some randomness still interjected here. And kind of the whole logic here is, let's say you put in five Bitcoin. Um, it's kind of an exponential rating. Like that would be rated like you put in 25. If you put in six, like 36. And the whole kind of logic here is the more you put in, <clears throat> that compounds and is preferred more so that it incentivizes somebody trying to maximize yield and profit in mixing with join market um, to put all of their shit into one fidelity bond. Because statistically, honest clients following the protocol will mix with them more often. Um, and it actually penalizes anybody who is trying to spread their liquidity around to Sybil attack something so they make less money and also get selected to mix with less often. Um, and so this is pretty much completely opt-in and backwards compatible. Like new taker clients will prefer anybody who has a, a fidelity bond advertised. And makers have to opt in and upgrade and create a fidelity bond um, in order to, to start advertising that. And so like this is seriously the biggest update in the history of join market. Fixing a big attack vector and a lot of incentives involved in shit. And like we're now going to see how the market plays out in handling that. And like really the, the kind of one big outstanding thing here is in the join market client. There is no support yet for creating a fidelity bond and keeping the keys offline. But I'm assuming that's going to be their next priority in um, things to implement. And like that makes no difference for advertising the fidelity bond. That's just an opt-in client change that's totally backwards compatible. So like this is the biggest update in join market history and also one of the biggest experiments ever in terms of like testing an incentive to um you know protect against civil attacks in these kinds of privacy systems and my theme at least personally in this episode is going to be calling back to all the comments about yield searching entities looking for returns hey if they do mining and they do lightning why not mixing so Seeing how this plays out is going to be very important um, in terms of how all of the shit built on top of Bitcoin evolves. Right on. That's awesome. Uh, advancements and join market, that's, uh, that's a great thing. Go earn that yield by helping provide privacy and fungibility to the network. You're here. But do you, do you guys see the theme of layering things on top of Bitcoin and the search for yield and the types of protocols that we need to solve big problems here and how they almost universally overlap. Like that, that needs to get acknowledged and considered and addressed. All right. Well, continuing on in that same vein, what's, uh, what's Ellen Runes? Uh, Rusty Russell, um, being a smart guy, like he usually is. No. So, uh, Rusty Russ, Rusty Russell runes. So, right. 
L and D um, had implemented a very neat um, kind of version of a cookie for authentication called a macaroon. And the whole kind of trick here is like the way you have a, a cookie stashed in your in your browser, like that lets you authenticate to some service you're interacting with. Well, <clears throat> a macaroon is the same kind of thing except um it's delegatable and the 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 way it's delegatable is if i have a cookie that lets me do x y and z i can make a cookie and give it to you um and allow you to do x y or z or just x or y or just x or z or y and i can i can give you not only the same permissions i have but a subset of the permissions i have and this is a very useful thing for building kinds of services or apps on top of an lnd node because you can give clients to that very granular authentication fab uh well all of that is built on and if you want to go off on a rant um and break that down a little more in detail i'm not gonna lie fun at this point I'm a, I'm a little tipsy uh like message authentication code um to do that which requires a shared cryptographic secret and kind of interactivity um between a client and a server before you can actually use um, that cookie to authenticate something. So what Rusty did <clears throat> is propose a simplified version of something like that that's kind of like an append-only um, data structure that allows, like, say, everything, and then everything minus one, and everything minus two. And, like, all you can do is restrict things more by appending to this. And the idea is that whoever issues this can hash all of this with a secret that they hold and then hand that out and that's your cookie. And somebody can extend that and feed that into the hash um, and kind of just, just have this thing to pass around that you can just provide to the server and the server just checks the SHA-256 hash of everything to verify it. And so accomplish the same kind of thing where you have this authentication cookie, um, but you don't have to interact to uh, like pass this off to a new person to access a service from a server. You just extend it and give it to them, and they push it to the server, and the server can verify it. So it, it's really just like a lot more simple, elegant way to do the same kind of granular permission access where somebody can delegate um, in a very granular way access to a service that they have access to, but only the things they want to delegate and nothing else. Yeah, it's, it's kind of on-demand authority which is kind of cool. Uh, it's the same as being mom and sending the kid to the store with your credit card. The, the person checking out doesn't care, right? But if you could only allow that credit card to do certain things within certain limits, oh, mom can send the kid to the store with the credit card all day. No more buying beer at the store, little Jimmy. <laughs> Just what's macarooned. Yeah, I just gotta say, dude, this is this is more solid, like fucking LN work out of Blockstream. That's just simplifying and generalizing things as much as possible. Like, love it. Yep, I like the concept a lot. It's uh, it's another building block right there. Right on. All right, ready for the last thing from Shinobi. Real quick, should we read this message from Fluffy Pony? Um, if he somehow got a message out that is more recent than the 21st, yes. Yeah, so I think this is his partner, Sa Saskia Spagny, 
uh, on Twitter, and she said a message from Fluffy Pony. Unfortunately, due to misunderstanding with regards to the setting of court dates in an old matter, which I have been, which I've continuously been trying to resolve since 2011, I've been held in contempt of court and currently awaiting extradition. I am hoping to resolve this misunderstanding within a short while. In the meantime, my business affairs will continue under the leadership of my partners. Ah, uh, that's good. That at least you can get a statement out. And that, you know... So timed fun. Fun time. Anyway, though, uh, yeah, last thing for me, a new version of firmware from the cold card, uh, 4.1.2, which has QR code support for transporting BIP85-derived uh, seeds in mnemonic, XPRIV, private key hex cases as well as showing XPUBs through QR codes, um, the main seed words, um, the transaction ID of a signed transaction, as well as the encrypted or encryption password for an encrypted um, SD backup, as well as, um, and I find this, this is, this is kind of a little, little cheeky subtle thing. Um, they will now grind the notes, uh, I'm assuming deterministically, or they're kind of breaking things, um, to guarantee a 71 byte or shorter signature, um, which follows um, how Bitcoin Core handles um, signature generation. So this will kind of give a very, very subtle um, anonymity or improvement in the sense that you will not be able to distinguish now whether a signature um, is generated by a cold card or Bitcoin Core in this little subtle heuristic. Like they'll kind of just blur together. Yay. So, whoop, whoop. on to you, Jimmy. Uh, well, just wanted to point out that uh, I published my uh, newsletter for the past month. It has eight stories and, uh, yeah, focused on Bitcoin privacy things like that and heuristics and such. Um, I think the biggest story this month was probably the EU AML proposal and FATF report. I think the other big one was Freedom of Bitcoin, which I included stuff about CBDCs because that stuff is getting ridiculous, at least in Europe. Um, there was a really funny section that I'm going to read from. Let me scroll down to it. So there was, um, there was a press release from, I think it was the Council of Europe, um, saying that they were going to start an investigation into a digital euro and they had this document linked in the press release called digital euro experimentation scope and key uh key leads or key ideas and um there was a section about privacy features that they thought should be included in the system like one-time pseudonyms for each transaction that users participate in, making it difficult for the receivers to link the numerous pseudonyms to the identity of the sender. They also mentioned transaction mis mixing and b a bilateral payment channel network, uh, which I thought was funny because they didn't provide any citations for any of these things, but I was like, hmm, oh, that sounds all very familiar. Uh, I wonder where they got those ideas from. Um, but then, of course, they end the section uh, by saying that if they use any of these things, they would have to be analyzed to verify that the high level of privacy does not violate AML, CFE regulatory requirements. So there's that. Well, I'll have to pick through it in detail because definitely appreciate you putting together, you know, what's going on this month in Bitcoin privacy. None of I those was... things that sound like a worthwhile trade-off if you can still turn the inflation nose on. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, I mean, well, they, I didn't, I mean, so they already kind of published the report and this was just a re basically a press release saying they were going to act on the report and it was actually the ECB, not, um, not the Council of Europe. Um, 
But yeah, they did have a thing about, uh, there's a New York Times article that I cite about um, saying like, oh, cat, how, well, they, they, they start off the article, it was a professor from Cornell, and he starts the article by saying like, well, when was the last time that you, uh, you use cash? And I just read that, I'm like, literally a few hours ago. Um, and so he basically says, oh, cash has security issues, blah, 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 and the benefit of the C- CBDC is that uh, the Fed and the ECB can implement negative interest rates and decrease people's accounts. Hmm. I'm just thinking, hmm. That it's it was just funny to like him saying, "Oh, cash has this like problem with theft," and then say the benefit CBDCs is mass economic policy of theft. <laughs> I think we all internalize that Futurama meme, the "Take my money" meme, way too hard. Who are these people that think it's great that people can take your money? I don't, I haven't met them yet, not in real life. Idiots. Also, did I don't know if did we ever talk about how the U.S. State Department is now taking cryptocurrencies as or they're giving out cryptocurrency as a reward for um, tips about malicious cyber activity, and this is the first time the U.S. government has ever done this. No, I don't think we. I haven't. I know we haven't talked about it on the show. Okay. Well, yeah. So July fifteenth, the U.S. State Department has a program called Rewards for Justice. And that it doesn't only have to do with, uh, quote, cyber stuff. Uh, It has to do with, you know, information about people who are on the wanted list or whatever. And they basically just do bounties for tips. And so they said in a press release that they would be offering up to $10 million for tips on malicious cyber activities against U.S. critical infrastructure. And they say that in order to protect the safety and security of potential sources, exact words, safety and security of potential sources, they're going to allow the tips to be submitted over Tor and they will they can give out rewards in cryptocurrency. <laughs> Man, the Chinese would have gotten so rich off that Hunter Biden laptop if they didn't just have this program around. Yeah. That's I, crazy. I, I, don't, I don't know if Hunter Biden's laptop is considered critical U.S. infrastructure, maybe. God damn it, woman. You have to align your priorities. So well, can, I just, can I just take a contrarian what-the-fuck position on the infrastructure bill for a second here? Sure. Um, yeah. The example everyone keeps using of a fucking invasive species in native ecosystems, um, like, uh, that's a big fucking problem. Like, that's why whole fucking agricultural crops go poof or become non viable or uneconomical. Um, hey, food supply is kind of important. I'm just fucking saying, like, of all the things to bitch about in that bill as that's not important infrastructure, it kind of is, idiots. Where the fuck do you think your food comes from? You know, I haven't heard about building a single bridge. What's the deal? I don't know. There's supposedly $66 billion for bridges and roads. Oh, there we go. Maybe one day you'll hear they're building a new bridge to your house. Oh, man. Yeah, just <laughs> drive drive north and south from Denver a little bit, and uh, you'll just take all the lanes you can get. Just pour the money into that, Feds. So I'll take it. Yeah. Uh. All right, you guys. Let's, let's, let's get into the final thoughts. All right. You might go first. You've got the link already. You, you should go first. So a small Assange update. Um, recently, there was a preliminary hearing with the UK High Court scheduled in his case uh, for August 11th, so next week, um, where and I, we don't know how long it will be, but basically there's very little information about whether it will be of substance or if it's just a hearing to schedule uh, basically a scheduled hearing to schedule other hearings uh so it may be very short and may not even have anything worth talking about but it's going to be the first hearing for the high court because the u.s government appealed the extradition decision from january 
which refused extradition to the U.S., and they are going to be appealing on, or, well, technically, they are allowed to appeal on three of the five grounds, uh, mostly due, mostly related to, um, like, technicalities and, uh, well, whether they can provide assurances against the claims that they will put him into solitary confinement, and it was very funny. They basically uh, tried to claim, no, we will definitely not do that, and then they there was a document that was like it was like actually hard to obtain it and the full details on the document basically said yeah we retain the right to put him in solitary confinement if he breaks the rules which it's like yeah we we know how that's going to go i hope everything goes well in that hearing it won't. maybe it will but probably not i got a couple of final thoughts here Unless you guys get anything on the Assange. It's terrible. All right, so I guess uh, Jack tweeted the other day, uh, you know, I don't, you know, like I was saying earlier, I got a problem with Twitter. I don't really care much about it anymore. This whole platform's like a censorship platform. There's only one side of arguments on here most of the time. But Jack, he retweeted, he tweeted out a good tweet the other day. I retweeted it. It was the, it was just the Wasabi wallet. Uh, you know, it was the Wasabi wallet and, you know, it just says reclaim your privacy and, you know, brings you to Wasabi. I'm so congratulations to Nopara. That's just like a pretty big deal to see like, uh, you know, the CEO of Twitter posting that people should take their Bitcoin privacy seriously and tweeting about the Wasabi wallet. That was really cool. So, uh, that's one of two fine thoughts. And the uh, the embedded uh, thing that popped up for it is obviously your uh, edited graphic. <laughs> yeah, that was really weird. Just to see, like, you know, I mean, because it is the Wasabi Wallet, you know, thing. But just to see the image where it's like, I made, I remember making that image. And, you know, like that image, it's like burned it in my head. And uh, so, like, to see it tweeted out from Jack, I was like, damn, that is pretty cool. That is really cool. But really, it's really cool for uh, for Nopara. It's just kind of cool for me. I get a little bit of art cred, I guess. Yeah, they, Wasabi should send you some of the prints that they have on the wall of their office that they made of that. Yep. Yeah, that'd be cool, for sure. I'll have to talk to Nopara and get him my new address. So, second bit of the final thought. You know, it's something Durango posted in here during the show, and it's just like one of this, like, I don't know, you know, when are we going to just, like, move over to another platform? Like, uh, so YouTube suspends Sky News Australia over COVID misinformation. <laughs> like, Sky News Australia is gone for a week from, you know, over 1.8 million followers on their YouTube channel. And, like, they're a legitimate news outlet. But, you know, apparently, you know, having on guests and talking about COVID-19 is just a little too risque for YouTube. So, oh, no. I mean, if that's too risky, we should probably be too risky, too. You, you said the trigger word. Now we're going to get a COVID label. Oh, yeah. Hey, guys. Want to hear some other fun stuff that's going to get us some more labels? Oh, God. Here we go. What's that? The Asia Society which has has many many ties to the ccp um is is starting an effort with american schools to push social justice and transform education hey hey bowzo um you stupid that's the Chinese word that encapsulates the meaning of dumb, arrogant, entitled Westerner that projects their own fucking laziness and insecurity and guilt onto the rest of the world in a subtle fucking superiority fucking complex that's completely unjustified and undermines themselves, i.e. a fucking idiot. We wouldn't let explicit madras money into this country, probably, I think. Uh, we do let Saudis give a lot of money to our universities. We do let Chinese give a lot of money to our universities. I don't know what the right answer around that money is, but 
we definitely got to keep in mind that there are external forces in this world that aren't actually trying to advance anything for us when they give money. Yep. FUD has no FUD. Yeah, I'm kind of out of FUD. Congrats on the uh, Jack tweet, everybody involved. Uh, good work, boys and girls. Yep, he's still a douchebag who completely contributed to fucking up social discourse in America um, with how Twitter handled things. So, uh, yeah. I, I, everyone's got anything nice to say? Did, have, we, uh, have we spoken about the shadowy super coders yet? Oh, God. <laughs> Fear the shadowy super coders. I don't even want to know how YouTube's going to tag the video now. We're gonna be banned. They beat it in on the Shabuoi Super Coders. You know what? I just wow. Nobody made that meme connection the whole time. I'm amazed. All right. Free Ricardo. On that note, adios, punks. Catch you later. Later, everyone. Bye. Peace. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>